So welcome everyone. It's so great that you're all here. It's the full moon and this south wind is blowing like crazy. So it feels auspicious. So thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. It is so good to see many of you interested in the conservation and remediation of the Pine Street Barge Canal. So many of you know, I am Ruby Perry and I, in the course of this evening, will be offering a glimpse of our vision for this 26 acres of wetlands in the heart of Burlington South End. I want, before I do that, let me introduce Aaron Lipman. There he is. And hello. hello, Aaron. He is going to be our technology person. Um, he's already managing things very well. He's a very early Barge Canal supporter. And Andy Simon. Hello. He is a master assimilator of pieces and parts. He'll be giving us a history of the Barge Canal that is informed by many, many hours of perusing the vast trove of information ranging from EPA documents to city maps to committee reports and you would not believe what else. And before we do that, let's introduce Jess Rubin. Where are you, Jess? Can you say hello? Jess? Good evening. Hi, Jess. Part scientist, part alchemist. She's a strong leader in the field of radical mycology. She's at home in the world of mycorrhizal fungi, mesocosms, and coppicings. She will be talking about the rich and complex work of remediation and rematriation of the barge canal. Remediation, I said that, right? And the, of the barge canal. Each of us, our plan is that we'll talk for six or seven minutes. And after each of our presentations, you'll, there'll be time for very specific clarifying questions. Um, so you'll be able to unmute, Aaron will manage that. Any of the larger, more general or complex questions we're gonna leave for after that it's more of a discussion after all of the information is out. <clears throat> we'll use chat as much as possible. So you can type your questions in anytime and we will um, we'll, we'll try to get to them. When we get to the end of the presentations, Jess will facilitate a, a discussion, but mostly we'll try to do it on chat. There's enough of us that I think that'll be the easiest thing. So we're really glad you're here. We really need you. So let's get started. So go ahead, Jess. So we acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Abenaki people. And this site is actually on the Siskoit territory um, of the Abenaki people. Acknowledging that we're on unceded territory is really not enough. It's really providing a lens that's guiding how we're approaching this and informs us to take responsibility for the atrocities that have occurred on this land from attempted genocide, land displacement, and eugenics. And so living amidst this settler colonial culture, um, we are keenly aware that, you know, a good way to approach this was to write Chief Menard, which we did, we're still waiting to hear back from him, and connecting with as many Abenaki as we can, because their ancestors lived in this location in seasonal hunting, fishing, and gathering grounds. And as we attempt to preserve it, clean it up, and turn it into an educational park, um, we feel it behooves us to also allow, invite, ask guidance from the Abenaki ancestral um, birthright of this land to guide us in, in, in what they see as the best vision and also in ways to empower them towards rematriation. We're still trying to understand what rematriation means, and we're learning a little through each conversation we have. And so that will be a continuing thread through this project. And we are going to mitigate the pollution. We're not um, obviously going to have Abenaki people have to mitigate pollution from colonialism, but the clean parts, the um, educational parts, the parts for ceremony and culture and connecting and community and healing, um, we're grateful to collaborate. Thank you. So now we are going to hear from Andy about 
some of the history. Andy, you're muted. Hi, hi. Um, hey. uh, I, I, uh, I'm keenly aware that some people here tonight, maybe even many people, already know the story of the Barge Canal land, maybe better than I do. But some people don't know anything. So I'm going to do a quick overview just to get us all on the same page. Can you go to that first slide, Aaron? Um, first, there was a wetland. Over many centuries, as the salty Champlain Sea evolved into fresh water, uh, Lake Champlain and indigenous people inhabited the land we call Vermont. The area around what is now the Barge Canal became a large abundant wetland along the lake, a transition zone between water and land. This, what you see before you, is the approximate extent in the early 19th century of uh, the wetland area with the barge canal, the current barge canal, right in the middle of it. Next slide, please. In 1849, a big change occurred. Burlington and Rutland railway line was completed, largely cutting off the wetland from the lake. The lumber industry in Burlington was expanding rapidly, and much of the remaining wetland was gradually filled in with sawdust and wood chips and even other things, creating space for storing lumber. Later, as more and more of the unfinished lumber was coming by sailing barges down the lake from Quebec, a canal was excavated into the wetland with a drawbridge to allow the barges to unload their cargoes and turn around. This is an excerpt of a bird's eye view map from 1887. And you can see Howard Street in the middle of it. That big factory there is the um, uh, Hickok Lumber Mill. Next slide, please. Lumber, uh, lumber production peaked in the 1870s. Then it fell off sharply in the 1890s. In the beginning of the 20th century, a new use for part of the filled wetland was found, a manufactured gas plant, turning coal into gas for heating, cooking, and light. These plants sprang up all around the Northeast, fueled by coal from Pennsylvania. This uh, is an image of a plant in Pawtuxet, Rhode Island, probably similar to the plant that was in Burlington. Next slide, please. Here's an aerial photo of part of the Barge Canal site looking north in Burlington in uh, the 1950s. That big drum-like building is for gas storage. The coal gasification plant operated until 1966, so about 60 years. Next. As you can imagine, this was a dirty process, creating lots of waste soaked with coal tar and other pollutants. It was all or mostly dumped out back in the wetlands and filled areas. Next. The coal tar waste soaked into the fill and peat soil over decades. With the rising environmental awareness of the 1970s and shocking stories of places like Love Canal in upstate New York, the US Congress created the Superfund legislation to give the newly created EPA supervision of industrial site cleanup. The Barge Canal was added to the Superfund National Priorities List in 1983. The EPA identified at the time 56 contaminants of concern at the site, some of which hydrocarbons and heavy metals are known carcinogens. Next. Here's a recent aerial view of the Barge Canal. In this view, Pine Street is running laterally near the bottom of the map. The railroad is at the top. You can see the site of the gas plant near the small red square on the lower left. Uh, the Superfund boundary is the blue line. After some remediation work in the mid 80s, the EPA in 1992 proposed a remedy for the site. It involved scooping up all the contaminated soil and storing it in a giant containment vessel. Faced with the idea of a 25-foot high, 13-acre toxic waste dump on the shore of Lake Champlain, the residents of Burlington, ultimately backed by their elected officials, rejected the EPA proposal. In 1993, for the first time ever, EPA withdrew their remedy and also for the first time created a local coordinating council to decide on a better plan. 
the council did extensive studies for almost five years and using consensus decision making proposed a new much scaled down plan. It focused on capping the coal tar on the bottom of the canal itself and essentially leaving the land part of the, of the site completely alone with regular monitoring of toxin levels in the soil and groundwater. It was accepted by all parties and enshrined in the EPA's 1998 record of decision. Next. This is an image from 2002 of the initial work done on the sand cap on the bottom of the canal. When coal tar seepage was discovered, this cap was redone in 2004 and again in 2009. Now it's hoped that the current cap will last for 25 years before it has to be replaced again. Next, here's another map oriented north-south this time that gives an idea of who owns what part of the barge canal land. The green parcels that you see are considered vacant land. The 11 acre parcel in the middle identified as zero Pine Street, you see that um, right here, zero Pine Street is owned by the city of Burlington acquired when the plan was to run the Southern Connector Highway straight through the Barge Canal. The two parcels to the east of that along Pine Street, 453 and 501 are privately owned and are currently for sale. The asking price is two and a half million dollars. There have been several redevelopment proposals for the private land over the last 25 years. And I know some of you remember them all. The most recent was a proposed office building and parking lot in 2015 Due to complications, cost, and potential liability of brownfield redevelopment, they've all been shelved. Next, please. My last map shows the current zoning of the Barge Canal site. You see the green boundary around the city land and the three small parcels along the railroad track that indicates conservation zoning. The private parcels along Pine Street are in the Enterprise Light Manufacturing Zone. With the urgent housing need in Burlington, there's been talk of rezoning these parcels for residential use. The problem is that the EPA and Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation have had restrictions on this land for almost 25 years because of real, real safety concerns, very, very real safety concerns, prohibiting residential development and childcare centers. So, um, we're going to take some questions. Um, if you have questions about uh, this section in particular, there'll be time for more general questions uh, later on. So Andy, I see a question um, when you were showing the map, if you could go back to the maps with the different borders. Yeah. Um, Larry, Larry Kupferman, uh, go back previous uh, map. One more. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what is the pink dotted line? Pink dotted line is what's known as class four groundwater. That's uh, highly polluted groundwater um, in that zone in particular. There's a, there's a classification, right? Class four groundwater. Okay, another question um, from Tree Spalding is, I thought because this is brownfield developments, de brownfields development is not allowed. So how can they build on it? Isn't that why they didn't put the Southern connector through there? And if they use the excuse that we need to build housing, you know it won't be affordable housing on the lake. And then the statement says some people want to make a lot of money. Well, this, this is a couple of great questions, Tree. And um, the, in fact, it is, um, there are pretty severe restrictions on what you have to do to put a building on, on this site. They include um, uh, drilling uh, down into, uh, putting pilings down to bedrock, which can be 100 feet down. Um, so there are a lot of engineering challenges, but they, it is possible under current rules to, if you follow the guidelines to put a building on this. Um, they um, have talked about housing recently, but since 25, for 25 years, there's been a restriction on this land prohibiting housing and childcare centers. Um, so, and in fact, I think the chances are good that they would put affordable housing here. And, um, and uh, we know there's a long history of putting uh, low-income housing on uh, questionable or toxic dumps all over this country. So um, it raises some big equity questions. 
Are there other questions about this? There are. I, I just mean, want to add another answer to that, which is in some of the documents, when you're reading through the development plans, there are certain areas that say more research is needed in these particular areas before development can come. So there are several research gaps that those whoever would be developers would need to fill um, before that can happen as well. Right. In fact, in fact, for each development that's proposed, there has to go through what they call a phase one and phase two um, analysis. They have to hire people to do these specific, specific studies, but and they would have to address those data gaps that Jess mentioned. Anything else? Uh, Larry Kupferman wants to know what is the nature of the Maltex pond? The Maltex pond was a particularly polluted area that in 1985, they, um, uh, the EPA decided before they proposed a remedy for the whole site uh, to scoop out, uh, I think it was something like 85 tons of material out of there and send it off somewhere else and refill it with um, uh, what they considered to be clean soil. So that was an area where there was uh, a lot of um, waste dumped and uh, EPA uh, in an initial attempt to remediate the site scooped out a whole bunch of toxic waste there. Okay, so I see two more questions. I'm going to ask these and I think we will pause on questions so that um, Ruby can share her piece and then if there's more questions at the end. So one question from Annie Hassley is, would the EPA organizations in charge change the guidelines if someone wanted to build on it? How do we prevent housing here? Um, I have talked to, the, to people at the EPA in Boston and the DEC, and there seems to be an indication that they might consider um, uh, changing those restrictions for uh, specific sites like um, 453 or 501. Um, <clears throat> it's worth noting that 453, which is the one closest to the Maltex building, um, is not within the Superfund site boundary. So it would have to be um, uh, Vermont DEC that changed the guidelines on that. But there are there is some indication that they might um, modify the guidelines under certain circumstances. One more question. Well, there is one more, but there was a two, that was a two part question. And the second part of that question was how do we prevent housing here? I think that that will answer that question later on when we talk about organizing. Okay, so Jean Bergman wants to know when, well, let us know that when BCA took the old Pepsi building, they had to deal with the EPA covenant. Do you have the details of what they did? Dunkiel Sanders did the legal work. Hmm, that's a really good question, Jean. And I don't know the details of that. I know that, um, a lot of the area around the Barge Canal, like Jackson Terrace, uh, like dealer.com, um, had uh, you know industrial waste because this was a big industrial area. Some of the waste from the uh, front in the Barge Canal is actually from the General Dynamics GE uh, complex, Bell Aircraft over on where the Innovation Center is now. But I don't know specifically about BCA, but um, I would love to look into that and maybe you could help me. All right then. So Aaron, if we can go to that beautiful slide number 12 of the, okay. So I'm gonna run through a few slides that highlight the benefits that we residents of Burlington are already getting from the Barge Canal land. This is falls into the heading of natural infrastructure and it already exists and persists despite the heavy impact that human industry has had on it in the last 200 years. Here is where we started our campaign. On a cold and wet day in mid-November, we gathered with about 15 other folks to consider how much the Barge Canal land was doing to heal itself and protect the lake. With debris from the land, late flowers and herbs from our gardens and paintings of mushrooms and birds, we created this altar as our collective offering of our gratitude to the land. In a very real way, we committed ourselves on that day to caring for this land and in doing so, began a campaign that continues with this Zoom rally and you. We'll talk more about that later too. So next slide. So let's talk about the benefits, the infrastructure, starting with the Gar Barge Canal provides invaluable habitat habitat 
to numerous species of mammals, birds, insects, plants, and other life. Here you can see an active beaver lodge in the foreground. While you can skate on the rest of the canal, the beavers keep the water open around their home, except for now, I think it's been cold enough. It is frozen. Every day, especially now in the snow, you can see birds and dozens of animal tracks. The landscape is alive and getting more complex as it diversifies. There was a recent article about a new species of springtail, what we call snow fleas, that was identified for the first time at the barge canal. With our help, the land will regenerate itself and maximize its diversity. Next one. The wetlands of the Barge Canal provide a buffer for the city from 100 year floods that we know will be occurring more frequently with our disrupted climate. These soft buffer zones epitomize the nature based solutions to climate change that the city is promoting in its recent draft amendment to the Open State Space Protection Plan that hasn't yet been published, approved. The plan has, but not the draft amendment. Next one. This is a map showing part of the South End stormwater sewer system. It shows the most active combined sewer overflow in Burlington is at the Barge Canal. These CSOs and the retention pond located behind the public works building are integral to the city's water system, particularly during major rain events, also more frequent now. Now I know it's too small for you to see, but if you look all along Pine Street, there are dots and there are also little X's. Each of those is a place where when the pipes overflow, that's where they come up. Um, so we show you this to illustrate how much the city's water system relies on the barge canal's capacity to absorb overflows. The city should be protecting this land as if its life depended on it. Next one. This is the weir that the EPA installed under the old drawbridge. I think some of you will have seen that from the bike path. It's an example of an EPA remedy. It aims to keep the coal tar from the barge canal from leaking into the lake. Next one. Wetlands absorb pollutants from roads and lawns and surface runoff that would normally flow directly into Lake Champlain. The Barge Canal wetland also keeps post-industrial contaminants that are in the soil from polluting, polluting the lake. The trees and shrubs growing here, even those considered invasive, stabilize the soil and prevent erosion. With our help, nature can do even more. Finally, and perhaps one of the most important benefits is that the Barge Canal reminds us of our history and our heritage, the early history of the lands original inhabitants, the natural history that abounds here, and the industrial history that continues into the present. So the next one. Why conserve the barge canal? Though certainly incomplete, you can see from this list that there are many reasons. As trees, plants, fungi, and microbes thrive at the barge canal, they have managed to contain and even transform the toxins left over from industry. Working with the land, we can learn more about those processes. Much more research needs to be done in this area to document the work that the land has done over, over the decades by itself when we've left it alone. So next slide. So let's go back for a minute. We're gonna work a little bit of imaginative magic. And look at this map that Andy showed earlier. This time, imagine the city's uh, little uh, rectangular parcel there as the center of the conserved barge canal, including the water. To the west across the canal are the three par parcels that will likely be donated to the city. Together, they are outlined in green. These are already conserved land, conserved land no development. Now, in your imagination, and I bet if somebody had the technology, we could have done this, but we don't. Drag that green line to the right, crossing over the parcels that are marked 453 and 501, all the way out to Pine Street. And you'll see in your imagination that the green line encompasses those two private parcels that are for sale. 
In your imagination now, do you get a sense of the entire 28 acres, including the canal itself, all within that green line? Voila, barge canal land conserved. All that we need to do is acquire those two four acre parcels along Pine Street between the Maltex building and Burlington Electric. And that would span from Pine Street back to the railroad and get them into conservation. We'll talk about that more soon. In our vision in the next slide, humans form a partnership with the hardworking land that has already begun. By letting trees grow on this land instead of buildings, parking lots, or toxic waste dumps, we've allowed the plants to do the work of carbon sequestration. Think of it, by not redeveloping the brownfield site, we've created climate resilience and allowed biodiversity to flourish here. By entering into formal partnership with the land and conserving the wetland as a whole, we can enhance the work already going on, brownfields to greenfields. In our vision, we work together to regenerate the land cleaning it up, planting native species, caring for it. We see, for, we see a laboratory for cold climate remediation, and Jess will tell us much more about that shortly. We are already talking about citizen science projects to see what is growing, a plant and animal inventory. We see students training to be scientists and developing methods of repairing the damage we humans leave behind. We see a classroom where students learn about biodiversity or beavers or simply learn how to listen. We see an interpretive boardwalk that demonstrates the natural, indigenous and industrial history of the land. We recognize, as just said in our land acknowledgement at the start, that this is stolen land. In our vision, indigenous stewardship is at the heart of our commitment to this work. We are learning with Abnaki elders to understand how we move towards true rematriation of the land. But turning it over to Jess, who will speak more about this aspect of the work and some of the science projects that are either already started um, and some that we are planning for the spring and that will be under her guidance. So, oh, oh wait, let's see. I'm, I'm going to read some questions, Ruby, that people have asked. Um, so the first question, is Susan asks how climate change will affect flooding? Well, we can assume that a couple of things. This is the lowest, as as uh, one of the Abanaki elders pointed out to me when we walked, uh, when she said was instructing me on how to read the land. That's the lowest portion before the lake, which means it's the first shelf. Which means as the lake rises, uh, that area will also flood. It's in, that's what it was meant to do. Um, but also, as we've already seen storms um, bringing more rain, bringing more storm water, this bringing more overflows of the city's um, uh, piping system. Um, that's definitely going to be a price of climate change. It'll overload the, the systems. So the next question is what, from Jean Bergman, what does the city assess those parcels at? Actually, I don't know, Andy, do you know that? You're um, uh, the, I just typed the, the two um, uh, things from the Burlington government, uh, Burlington city database into the chat. And in fact, the, the, the assessments are incredibly low. I think that's a very pertinent question. The, the, the total value for 501 Pine Street uh, assessed value is $22,200. And the assessed value for um, uh, 453 Pine Street is not that much more than that. So in fact, you know, asking two and a half million dollars for this land is, is uh, uh, considering how low the assessment is on the land currently is pretty outrageous, but uh, more to be more to be said about that. And Larry's question about real estate appraisal, um, uh, I don't think that they've been appraised, and I think that that's just um, um, aspirational price that uh, that Rick Davis is uh, asking for that. And, and as far as I know, uh, maybe they were appraised when. Um, when Redstone in 2015 was thinking of uh, 
um, doing it, but I don't, I don't know about that. Uh, but, but in fact, there's not a current appraisal of those parcels. And I don't think that the sales, the current sales price has anything to do with the, the appraised value. And what would you say, Andy, to Jean Bergman's statement that the city's open space fund is a source of money to use as part of an eminent domain campaign to buy those parcels? I think that that's that's to be discussed. I mean, uh, the problem, Jean, is that, uh, and and I'm looking forward to you being on city council after March 1st, um, is that uh, so far the city uh, government has not express much interest in doing that. And the, so the, the gatekeepers of those funds uh, have not been enthusiastic about using them for such a, uh, an acquisition. So we, we definitely should talk about that more. And Carolyn Bates has something said here, but I'm not quite sure she's um, remarking to, that someone is selling land and we should be asking them, but I'm not quite sure what, she, what, she, what she's saying there. We're gonna talk about this pretty soon as a as a whole so let's let's hold the whole selling the land and what the next steps are um because we still want to talk about a little bit about what's happening on the on the land and also all of the people that we have talked to so far because it's pertinent to all of these questions so let's go ahead jess with with um with your part Okay, so um, in talking about remediation to clean up pollution, I actually want to invite us to step out of the paradigm that we're currently living in mainstream, you know, could call it America, Turtle Island, uh, 2022, where the mainstream form of remediation is scoop and move and dump and then build. And it's based on a timeline and a budget. Um, and this is really what's practiced, and it has been practiced in this town. I was just listening to um, a webinar today about that happening at another spot in town. And uh, a new friend, Scott Kellogg, who's colleagues with Andy and Ruby, who did a lot of remediation in Austin, Texas, um, was, was, was reminding me that as we approach this work, we really need to look at the long view. And this, if you think about the history that Andy and Ruby went through today, it's, it's two and a quarter centuries at least of pollution. It's not something that's gonna get cleaned up in a day or a year. So first changing that view and knowing that it's gonna take a long time if we're actually partnering with the microbes of fungi and plants that are already doing a lot of remediation. And as Andy mentioned, there's 56 contaminants. That's a pretty complicated cocktail. And um, there's no one species that's going to be able to remediate all of those, but there are many species out there that can remediate those toxins individually. So it's going to take a lot of research. And I also want to note that there's 46 brownfield sites in Burlington area. And so this is a wonderful opportunity um, for us to start the process of changing that mainstream remediation mode and demonstrating that we can learn and invite other people. And so the field that this is within is ecological restoration. And um, some people call it ecological reconciliation because we can't really restore the ecosystem to what it was, but we can reconcile the damage. And two subfields of this field are microremediation working with fungi and phytoremediation working with plants to remediate these toxins. You are likely familiar with bioremediation. That's what's working at the wastewater treatment plant. And they're certainly, those microbes are certainly involved in microremediation and phytoremediation. And there's also mycophytoremediation using fungi and plants. So I just wanna highlight a couple of techniques that um, colleagues and I and others have used and to give us some view and understanding that this is, is very possible. This is a spawn that some of us grew through gathering wild spore from a local saprophytic fungi that eats dead wood. Now, some of these saprophytic fungi eating cellulose or lignin in trees recognize hydrocarbon bonds and they can break down. Some of the toxins that are in this list are hydrocarbons, all different forms. And so one of the ways that this work can be done 
is by growing some of the fungi that we know can break down some of the toxins on the list. And I recommend doing it in a bench uh, lab, like a laboratory. And this is some that we, this is what it looks like. This was Trimides versicolor. You may know as turkey tail that we had grown from that spawn. And then imagine that you find the toxins that are in the soil and then you do several different concentrations and you can train fungi. You can train strains so that over time they can deal with higher concentration levels. And you do that in a lab where the conditions are controlled and you can really understand the dynamics and everything that's involved. And this is a wonderful opportunity for students. I do wanna note that currently at UVM's Plant Soil Science Department, um, PSS 269, uh, Soil Water Pollution class, which I took a few years ago, um, students in that class now are doing research at the site and looking at some of the many research gaps that are in some of those documents we, re we referenced earlier and starting to look at what species, which toxin. And it will take years to get through the list of 56 and imagine doing these bench trials, but then you can bring it to the field. Once you have some species and you know they can work on the concentration, we can have these field trials and we could have educational signs, we could have middle and high school students, students learning, um, and meanwhile, the rest of the area can be a park. This is also a wonderful opportunity for all sorts of people in society to get involved. Um, it doesn't need to be all scientists. You can have a few scientists involved, and then parents and students, neighbors, elders, um, and this is a uh, filtration sock when we were remediating a river in Colchester, trying to learn how to, um, you know, lots of people came out and learned. And these are skills that are essential for this time that we're living in. Technically, these are skills that you would think we would have had already. And it's kind of odd, we're learning them reactively rather than proactively, but going forward, this is the work of our generation. And this is an example, because we had noted at this site, there are a lot of non-native species, and of course they play a role. Um, but this is an example of an area overgrown by buckthorn that you would think, wow, that's daunting. How are we ever going to recover that with no chemicals? And there are some brilliant people in our community, including um, someone you may know named Mike Bald of Got Weeds, who had taught us to cut the stumps at belt height. Um, the ones not near waterways, you can pull out through muscle and community power. Um, the ones near the waterway, you leave intact and you may need to cut regrowth two or three times in one season, but then you can plant native species in this case, because it's a repairing ecotone, you know, we would plant polycultures based on what would naturally grow there. And this is an area, um, this is an example of how, again, many people can be involved. Everyone can have different roles. A few people can guide. Um, and then this is what that area looked like um, the summer after, and you can see the stumps right here. So it's very possible. This is within our reach. We can work as a community. There are so many experts. There's so many um, people that are just willing and ready to help and all hands on deck. Um, so I just wanna kind of encourage us to um, think positively and um, trust that you know, this land can be recovered and it can also be an example of all the other places and a model. Um, and to just note that we are starting a citizen science group this spring. So everyone's welcome to join. We're gonna start inventorying the already um, quite diverse uh, community, natural community that's there. And there will be a lot of opportunities, at least on the 11 acre piece for now. Um, and there are a couple other universities and homeschool groups that are interested in starting many research projects. And Abanaki people have spoken to us about different ideas they have of ways they can do ceremony here and ways that their rich history, their rich memories of the place can be um, brought to the center and um, we can all take care of this um, critical ecotone together. And so I'm just going to now read a few questions that came in. Oh no, actually those aren't questions, those are comments. So if anyone has questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Meg Pond says, did you see that one? We know that Lake Champlain has become increasingly sick with excess phosphorus and other des destabilizing elements. The Pine Street Barge Canal area of life and vitality is precious to the long-term health of all of this area. So 
Did you want to comment on that, Jeff? Well, yeah, Meg Pond, that's spot on. I mean, this spot is a critical ecotone. And also in terms of stormwater, as Andy and Ruby mentioned, it funnels like through this site. And that buffer is, is critical and needed. And there's a lot of remediation um, that can be done. Now, Tree wants to know if there's a chance UVM would buy this as a research site. I have no idea. That's a really interesting idea. Um, that's out of my wheelhouse. So I'm going to hand that over to <laughs> Andy or Ruby. <laughs> we, we haven't um, actually approached anybody at UVM about that. But since, as Jess said, we, we do have UVM students in plant and soil sciences down there now. Um, we're, we're taking a slightly uh, uh, from the bottom approach to, to that kind of idea. Um, somebody asked, Sylvia asked, um, have we been in touch with Lake Champlain Land Trust? Actually, um, indirectly, there is somebody on this call who's on the board of uh, Lake Champlain Land Trust, and we did discuss it uh, uh, indirectly when we were uh, talking about this, the question of the barge canal. So we will uh, certainly follow up more with Lake Champlain Land Trust. And they, people have been making great suggestions, actually. Um, uh, Carolyn suggested talking to the real estate agent at Needy, and, and that was one of the first calls that I that I made. But I am going to talk um, about uh, some of the things that we've done, uh, just to give you uh, sort of a picture of where we've um, what we've been doing uh, since November. But do you have any more to add, Jess or Ruby? No, I think you should go ahead, time wise. Okay. We'll, we'll so uh, um, since our rain soaked ritual in November, you saw the altar. We've been pretty busy. We started early uh, talking to uh, Abnaki elders and leaders just to kind of get our, our grounding on our role as non-Indigenous settlers on this land. So we've been having those discussions sort of uh, continually as we go. Um, we launched an online petition that no doubt all of you have signed. I hope all of you have signed. If not, we'll put it in the chat. Um, as of today, there are 563 signers, and most of them are from Burlington. We presented this petition back when it was, I think, 250 signers uh, and asked for time on the agenda of the Burlington Conservation Board, the Parks and Rec Commission, the Planning Commission. We also brought it to the City Council. Um, only parks put us on their agenda and responded with a polite comment that they had no current plans to work on conserving any barge canal land. Um, we presented the petition to the city council, as I said, and had further discussions with uh, councilors Max Tracy and Jack Hansen. Uh, we had an extensive conversation with uh, Samantha Dunn, uh, who's assistant director at CETA. We've made contacts with the Boston office of the EPA, had numerous exchanges with the Barge Canal project manager, whose name is Graham Bradley at Vermont DEC. We have had discussions with um, Vermont Land Trust, the River Vermont River Conservancy, uh, indirectly uh, through the River Conservancy with the Nature Conservancy. Um, and as I said, we did, I did have a peripheral contact with the Lake Champlain Land Trust. We had a phone call with Rick Davis, who's the owner of the private land at the Barge Canal, who has no objections at all to it being conserved as long as he can get the money that he's asking uh, out of it. We made a contact with uh, John Callo, who works with Russ Scully, uh, who owns a small parcel of the wetland area that he bought when he bought the Blodgett plant. And it appears likely that he's willing to donate that parcel. We've talked to South End business leaders like Steve Conant. We talked to uh, the Lake Champlain uh, committee. Uh, we've talked to UVM students. We've talked to UVM professors and uh, St. Michael's, a uh, St. Michael's professor. Um, I think we can say that we are pretty directly engaged with uh, most of the parties that were always open to suggestions. Um, so far, we have not received uh, any significant support from, uh, from city officials. I think that we are waiting uh, to get, I think most of them are waiting to get a signal from, uh, from the mayor or from uh, higher up in the city administration. So that discussion is um, is continuing. Now, we need your help. Uh, where are we with the conservation of the Barge Canal? Um, 
the the um, administration's attitude so far is we don't have the money, we need housing, we need to expand the tax base, all of these discussions, it's private land that boils down to we don't have the power. Through our work together in the coming weeks and months, through organizing and speaking out, we need to get them the power to conserve all of the land between the Maltex building and BED from Pine Street to the railroad line to mobilize the resources we need to turn these brown fields in to green fields. Uh, Ruby, you gonna take it from there? I will, and briefly, because um, I think there are more questions, but we decided we would tell you the questions that are outstanding for us. Um, we have some, and we don't have answers to them. In the absence of support from the city, how do we proceed? Are there potential inherent liability risks associated with this property, even if left undeveloped? The EPA, when we ask them that question, will only consider specific proposals to answer. To, you know, to respond to that question. What is a fair price for the land? What entity might hold this land and the vision? In the absence of a land trust, how might we begin fundraising for an appraisal and ultimately for acquiring the land? We're committed to working on this, but are there enough others who feel that same commitment? Another chance to speak out will be the city's promised public input sessions for the South End rezoning. After the mayor published his MOU, he said they would start in January. We haven't heard anything yet. But people need to go to those meetings and speak about the importance of conserving the Barge Canal. The residents of Burlington have stopped ill-conceived plans for this land in the past. Remember 1993, the story of, of um, stopping the EPA's proposed mountain. But we need your energy. We're ready to expand our small impromptu committee into something more tangible, something creative and quick thinking, an entity to act together, to develop strategies and spread the work around. So let us know as we talk, we finish talking tonight, we'll put our emails in the chat. You can call, you can respond in any way, but we need your help. How else can we power this up? So let's open it up. And Jess, I'll let you field questions and we'll mostly put them in the chat. I think we can start with Isaac's. Yeah, so Isaac wants to know um, what Vermont Land Trusts are interested in this land and saying that they signed on to the Innovation District MOI, well, MOU, yeah, the question. I, I, can, I can answer that question. Um, well, I can try to answer that question. I have ha talked, uh, twice to Nick Richardson, who's the CEO of uh, Vermont Land Trust. And he did sign the, uh, the Memorandum of Understanding on South End Rezoning as a, um, a stakeholder in that, in that MOU, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to contact him right away. Um, I'm still not sure exactly why Vermont Land Trust is part of that group. But um, they have been, uh, after initial uh, enthusiasm from Vermont Land Trust, they've been a little backed off of uh, um, their um, sort of eagerness to get involved. So I think, again, they're waiting for a signal from the city, tell you the truth. I think that's happening uh, right along. So there's a few, so one a point from Larry, um, Coop, Cooper, Kufferman Cup, is um, Kupferman, excuse me, is saying the scientific approach is wonderful and, he, and is mentioning the importance of environmental liability, um, legacy of the Superfund site parcels, and that is like really important point. So when I, we were guiding the students at UVM because we created like a project, you know, for them ish, well, we gave them many options, but sharing all of the data gaps, we laid out like safety guidelines, and so yeah, there's some very basic safety guidelines. Um, and then depending on how sampling goes and, you know, obviously the more you sample, the more you have to um, go more strict with those. So yeah, that's a really important point and we're tracking it, but we're also aware that that might be why a lot of organizations are not wanting to touch this um, because that's a liability issue. Um, but we feel we can be navigated responsibly. Um, the, an the answer to the question from Tree about recording this, it is being recorded and it will be available on Channel 17 CCTV 
um, as soon as they posted, they they agreed to um, they actually solicited a recording of it, and we'll give it to them, uh, and then people can see it on their on their um, website. Um, I, Sylvia asked a question that I just wanted I answered in the chat, but I want to answer verbally too. Um, is it only Burlington residents that can sign the petition, or do we prefer that? And my answer is no. I think everyone is welcome. Uh, we've I, I uh, uh, mentioned the fact that the majority of people are Burlington residents, but only because I think that decision makers in the city are uh, swayed by you know having many Burlington residents and not just uh, you know not so much people from Shelburne, Charlotte, and like Berkeley, California, when my brother signed. Um, but uh, the uh, I, I I think it's great to have everybody sign this petition. I don't think it needs to be people from. Uh, this is this is a, a you know an an Earth question. Uh, it's not just a Burlington question. So Carol wants to know: Can we start on the land of Pine Zero in testing and replanting? Carolyn Bates wants to know that. Well, I think that's a question for. For, for you, I mean, we're planning on, the students will be doing research this fall. I mean, this right now, this, this semester, and in the spring, we'll start doing the land, the assessment of, of what's there, the inventory. Whether we start planning, I think planting, I think there, there'll need to be a, a plan for that. You know, I think it would only be on the public land, the 11 acres, as you say. Um, we're not there, we're not there planning that yet. We've. Yeah, I think we need to do an inventory first um, and gather a team for that and then also figure out who we need to speak to about that plan. And it would be great to obviously have all citizens have input for that. Um, um, Emily asked if this discussion will be public. Um, if uh, is it, we should have asked if anybody in who's asking questions and um, who's been identified in this discussion would prefer that they not be uh, uh, on a recording or on um, channel 17 when it's being broadcast, not on TV necessarily, but on their website. So um, yes, the answer is when this recording is public, it will uh, be available to anybody. So um, if, if that's a problem for anyone, um, we should drop you out of it right now. <laughs> I don't know how to do that, but and probably uh, ten minutes ago. Yeah, and if anybody doesn't want to go to channel seventeen, they will send me a copy of the uh, Zoom recording. So you can just send me an email, and I'll send it to you. Send you the link. I think it probably takes twenty four hours or something. And uh, Carolyn was just asking to know, letting being let know when and where the inventory. Um, so the way that you'll hear about that is um, the information um, emails that Andy and Ruby have been sending out. If you're on that email list, you will find out about that. It's likely going to be in April, early April. I mean, one of the things I think would be helpful is, is if we had a good website up and running, but of course we don't have that and we don't have anybody who stepped forward to say, oh, I'll do that for you. Actually, we do have a friend who said she would set it up. Um, but that takes time and um, she needs help. So this is why we're also reaching out. <laughs> after. There was a request about how to find the URL and Zoom recording. So is that something that you all will email out to everybody? Yeah, well, yes, I guess I'll email it out. I think I can email it out to everybody who's in, who registered. So I can do that. Yeah. So there was a ask um, by Jean if there's other documents prepared by you besides the slides and petition. And I would say that there is a very robust folder um, that we put together um, and we created um, some projects for research there. Um, and that's currently just accessible currently to like students doing research there. Um, but I'm sure that at some point when we figure out our website, and all that, we can find a way that a lot of those documents are available because they're, they have a lot of really interesting historical facts and um, important pieces that hopefully we can work with. So, I, 
I'd say that I'd say that you know um, one of the one of the issues that's uh, hampered this campaign somewhat is the small number of people who've been involved in it, mostly Ruby, me, and Jess. And uh, uh, we need more people. We need more energy. So anybody that wants to uh, step into the center of this uh, in any in any way that um, you feel is appropriate, you should um, contact. Here's the um, uh, uh, SOS Burlington at gmail.com is our uh, email that you can get us at. Um, that it would be great to hear from you. And, you know, we can talk further about um, ideas and ways you can help. Uh, we will be having, um, uh, we will be doing um, presentations at the, um, the NPA meetings in March, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we've made a request for all the NPAs in the city, um, the neighborhood planning assemblies to present. Um, and you know, the, um, the different um, meetings that are gonna come up for South End zoning that the city is gonna run are gonna be, it's gonna be very important that people uh, show up to those and ask questions and speak out for the barge canal really. Um, the the dates of those have not been announced, um, but um, there is a, an intimation that those are going to start at the end of this month and go through March. So um, please, uh, we'll we'll definitely send out alerts, but please uh, be alert to um, Front Porch Forum and other uh, venues for the city to announce when those zoning meetings are. And and please come down. We need lots of people power to make something change here because otherwise they're going to do things in the same old way that they're used to doing the same old developments and well, the same old desecration of, of the land. And speaking of that, um, Aaron, will you put up that last slide that has um, writing on it? It's a question that you all didn't ask yet that I want to, I want to put out. Um, what, what, what is very likely to happen, we've already heard it from CETO and the mayor already intimated is um, and it's classic um, Mayor um, Weinberger's process is why not just compromise, build on the front border that, that borders Pine Street and conserve the back. So the, the 11 acres is already conserved and he's already said he imagines a legacy park. So we just put together, um, I'm just gonna read it because I think you all need to hear this because these are the question, this is the main question that they're gonna ask. So it's a rare opportunity to protect a mini quarter, corridor for birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, insects that enjoy the rich zones of this ecotone and live in different proximities to that waterway. Leaving this untouched allows space and time for us to create more comprehensive remediation studies and pilot research projects so that the cocktail of toxins can be remediated from all of the soil and water. Building on top of polluted land, only having part of it to clean up just leaves that for the next generation to deal with because over time, these pollutants will volatize, plume and leak into the surrounding ecosystem. It is in the perfect conditions now to be protected, remediated and conserved. It, is, it will never be like this if they start paving it over or even worse, digging it up and hauling it away. It's located at the intersection of significant stormwater coming from the city and adding more impermeable surfaces will only exacerbate runoff and contaminant loads entering the lake. It gets at the heart of rematriation to not build when we always build. So um, Gordon in, in the chat suggested um, having a campaign strategy meeting. Um, and uh, I think that that is something that we'll propose. And uh, people who want to participate in planning campaign strategy can show up. Um, that, um, that's one of the next steps. It's got to be one of the next steps. And Emily's thank, thank you for that suggestion. Emily's proposing a listserv. Um, 
So we can have private exchanges as we plan. I think that's a good idea. Um, I don't know how to do that if people, to know whether people wanna be on it or not. As it is, we're sending out enough that enough people send me daily. Would you please take me off this list? So um, why don't you write the SOS um, address and say you wanna be on a listserv and we will put together a listserv where we can have uh, strategic discussions and updates and everything else and call calls to action. And you got, and I think you posted that SOS, Andy, right? That yeah, email. I'll do it again. Okay, so we've passed the 8.30 mark. We can officially say we are done. Um, I think it's been absolutely incredible to have all these listening ears. And I really, really thank you and all of the ideas. And I feel excited, renewed excitement, in fact, that we may have help as we move forward. Anybody else? Any of any of you, Andy, Aaron, Jess, let's want to sign off, say goodbye. Any last things? I think I, I think I want to say um, uh, thank you to uh, Tiff Bloomley and Gabrielle Stebbins, who uh, are our state representatives in our district, who've been very supportive of this campaign and who've lent us uh, half an intern um, to help out with with various tasks, Annie Hazley, who's on this, been on this uh, Zoom meeting. Um, and they've been uh, great listeners and great suggestors and uh, very, very supportive. And that's been, that's been helpful. And thank you, everybody. Um, Jean, is, Jean is asking that whether people identified by wards who are Burlington residents. Uh, Jean Bergman was asking that. And he, Jean also said that he would, he would make it a topic of his campaign and help put it forward. So thank you for that, Gene. Great. Thank, thank you, you so everyone. much, everyone. We really appreciate it. it. Takes a village. So maybe Aaron, un unmute so people can say goodbye. I love to hear the sound. <laughs> Everybody unmute and say goodbye so, so it feels like. <laughs> goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Sweet dreams. Bye bye. 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 <laughs>No, we're not going to yes. sing, Carolyn. Thank you. <laughs> well, Charlie can. I can go on the recording. That'll be for the fundraiser that we do later after his Right, office. right. Let's hope. Charlie, do you yeah. need some help driving or something? <laughs> do you uh, need help, Charlie? I don't have a car anymore, so I don't need help driving. I have car shares. I can drive, but um, thank you so much for asking. Well, I can do some errands or something for you if you want. Oh, shucks. Well, why not? Thanks. Why go not? To the market or something. A lot of I people. I also have a courier service that does errands for me. Who could help you? All right. Mm, so that's nice. Why Ruby, you ask? saw that note? I do see it. I do see it. I'll respond to you directly, Charlie, later, okay? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I did. Thanks, everybody, yes. for coming. Great to see you all. Thank you, Andrew. Good job. Good work. And thank you. Yeah, bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye, Laura. Bye, Tom. Bye, bye, Aaron. You. Bye, Jeff. Bye, Carolyn. Thank you. Carly. Thanks. See you again. <laughs>